man, I don't, I didn't know how handsome you look without that mask, bro. It's just, these masks, they don't show everything. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. Good, glad to have y'all here. Uh, I am glad to be here. Uh, you have to be here, <laughs> but I, I'm glad that I get to be here. And uh, I love hip hop. Anybody here love hip hop? You just love it, like it, can like you tolerate it. All right. Uh, I, I started a gospel rap group back in the day. Preachers in Disguise is the name of the group. P.I.D. Actually, uh, that's what it stands for. P.I.D. Preachers in Disguise. At the time, we were just little hood rat kids just starting out. We didn't know that medically there is a medical term for P.I.D. If anybody's in the medical profession or you're studying to be a nurse or a doctor, I, we didn't know it. We just started out. We were just hood. We was like preachers in disguise. That's what we do. We preach and we rap. And so we rap, but we we preaching in disguise of rap, right? And so uh, when I got with somebody that was a professional, they told me, do you know what PID stands for? And I was like, and it was actually Josh McDowell. I don't know if anybody ever heard of Josh McDowell. He's my mentor, uh, and he is my hero. He's been in the game of ministry for years. And so he came up to me. He's like, do you know what PID stands for? And I was like, yeah, preachers in disguise. Yeah, what? You know? And so he was like, no, it actually stands for something medical. And I was like, what? And now I'm all intrigued. And he said, it stands for pelvic inflammatory disease. I was like, what? And I didn't know what that was, but it sounds like something's wrong. All down here in these regions down here, just something ain't right. <laughs> and, uh, so my face turned all red. He couldn't tell, though. So, <laughs> but I got all embarrassed, you know, and I told him, no, that's what, our, what, what, what we about. We, we about just preaching. But anyway, we kept the name. But uh, anyway, we, we, we traveled and did a lot of stuff. And I love utilizing hip hop, uh, poetry, uh, different ways of t storytelling. And so, uh, one of the projects that I did, the name of the project is called uh, Look Around, and it's the entire book of Ecclesiastes translated into spoken word and into hip hop. So can I do a little bit of uh, the third chapter with you guys? Can I do that? Now, some of y'all, if y'all really a hip hop enthusiast, you'll give me a little love and stand up with the beat start. If you're not, I understand it's not even like 11 o'clock yet and it's Monday, so I get it, but I'm going to rock. So if you rock with me, rock with me is that okay is that okay thank y'all right. thank y'all so much for letting me get wide open for just a little bit here in this lovely beautiful morning i want to talk a little bit about the life and times of jesus and i think it's so important to study the life and times of Jesus. That particular song that we did and that I did, I uh, kind of came from the idea of taking each verse of the scripture and translated it into a, um, translated it into hip hop form. What does the Bible say from a hip hop form, hip hop style of translating that late in that verse? And that's a powerful chapter. It says that everything, there's a time and season. And so if we study the life of Jesus and look at the life and times of Jesus, you see all types of times and seasons that he's in. And I'm going to look at a season, a time of the life of Jesus that we don't often look at. And so I'm going to put the scripture up on uh, the screen and we're going to look at this particular uh, moments, these moments in the life of Jesus. If the scripture says that everything there is a time and season and everything fits where that's why I said you gonna get your turn and I'm gonna get my turn. Back in the day, they did a song on the third chapter of Ecclesiastes. Uh, a bunch of hippies put the song together and they said to everything, turn, turn, turn. There is a season, turn, turn, turn. Well, those truths are everlasting. They never end. And that's what makes that song so relevant to today. Everything. And so if everything happens, there were time and seasons in Jesus's life that uh, we don't always talk about, but they were there. So I'm going to go to the seventh chapter of the book of Mark, and I'm going to read this. And it says that then he returned from the region of Tyre and Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And they begged him to lay his hands on him and taking him for aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ear and after spitting, touched his tongue. Uh, and it says, and looking up to heaven, he sighed. Everybody say that with me. And looking up to heaven, he sighed. And he said to him, Ephapha. That is, be opened. 
and his ears were open and his tongue was released and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one, but the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure saying, he has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. I want to draw your attention again to that 34th verse in the book of Mark in the seventh chapter, uh, that 34th verse, it says, and looking up to heaven, he sighed. Imagine the son of God coming down from heaven here on earth, still remembering the glory. Remember the, the 17th chapter of the book of John, Jesus remembered the glory that he had with the father. He remembered heaven. Wouldn't that be amazing to actually come here? I heard this story once of these two babies, like this one baby that was just born and her, her little brother was about four years old. And uh, and this was two parents. They shared the story. Is that they 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 introduce, of course, the little baby to the four year old, and the four year old sees the little baby sister, and he loves her and everything. But then the mom and dad they walk out of the room, and then they just kind of peek over and around the side, and they heard the little fourth year old look at his little sister. And he said, quick, quick, before you grow up and forget everything, tell me what it's like to be in heaven. Jesus knew what it was like to be with the father. And the Bible says that as he's about to pray for this guy who was deaf and, and, and he had a speech impediment and couldn't talk and he laid his hands on him before he did it, he took a moment and just looked up. And I can wonder, but just wonder what was going on in Jesus' mind as he looked up to heaven and sighed. And then he said to him, be opened. I want to talk about moments in Jesus' life when Jesus sighs. That's my message, when Jesus sighs. I mean, we know what it's like to sigh. We know what it's like to kind of have this sense of aspiration or exasperation where you just, <sighs> you know? Anybody have those moments in your life where you just, <sighs> Huh? You have those. Maybe you woke up this morning. Maybe your alarm went off and you was just like, <sighs> right? Here, Jesus sighed. And like I said, I wonder what was going through his mind. Because Jesus sighs a couple of times in the Bible. Here's my question. Have you ever <laughs> made Jesus sigh? <laughs> Have you ever, I mean, because think about that sigh, just, <sighs> and, and it's like a stinging question to ask yourself, have I ever made Jesus sigh? Like the Bible says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. It's the last thing I would want to do. And I don't know about you, but like secretly in the back of my mind, I have these questions. I have questions. I wonder, have I ever really made Jesus just sigh where he's just like just at the point of being tired of me. And the only thing that he could do is just sigh that he really wants to say so much more. Like he wants to say, I'm tired of you and your foolishism. It's time for you to grow up. It's time for you to get better that that same sin that you've been doing, are we really back here again, Fred? Are we really doing this again? And he's just like, ah, for real, for real, Fred? <laughs> Is that where you're at? And I, I wonder in the back of my mind if he's ever just at the point of just saying, I'm done with you. I'm tired of you. And he's like, you know what? You know what? I, I put up with Peter and I put up with so many people, but you don't understand, Fred, what this is. This is a kingdom. And I, I kind of like fearfully on the inside wonder if Jesus would ever just get so sick and tired of me that he'll just kick me in my stomach. That he'll just kick me in my stomach and he'll just, you know, he'll just go, this is kingdom. And just boom, just kick me out of the I don't know is that am I the only one or is there anybody just wondering if Jesus was like if you do that sin if you allow that sin to happen one more time I am going to go straight just 300 on you and be like this is 
kingdom. Is there anybody? I don't know if it's just me. And then it's like, that's not enough. Then Jesus was just like, you know, boom, just knock me out of the kingdom. I'm done with you. We're not doing this anymore. You know what? You could try to repent. I ain't listening to you. I'm done with you. And then Jesus was like, they didn't even know who I was. I, this is how I do it in the kingdom. <laughs> that's just what I mean. Like, like will, will Tabor ever invite me back because I gave these weird cartoons of Jesus? I don't know. It's just I wonder things in my mind. And this is the reason why we have to study the real Jesus. Because so many times, things that travel in the back of my mind, it's not even the real Jesus. It's not, Jesus is like, that's not me. That's not me. So we got to understand what happened when Jesus sighed. Now, the concept of, of sighing is this. If we go back to uh, this verse here, uh, when Jesus sighed and looking up to heaven, he sighed. The Greek word, that's actually how the Greek is, is, is written out there, that Greek word. And there is an actual word for that. And those that don't know Greek, I kind of put it out phon phonetically so you can know what the Greek actually says. And it's this. You guys can all say it with me. What the word sigh actually in Greek, it means stanazo. So everybody say stanazo. Say it again, stanazo. You got to say it like you're about to give some Greek, a Greek dish. Yeah, you're just stanazo. He, he, he stanazoed. And, and what does this mean that he stanazo? Well, the, 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 the literal root of the word stanazo is to tighten or to narrow. And, and, and it's, it's to allow wind to come out, but it's coming out in a tightened or narrowed uh, passage. That's where the word sigh. In fact, we could probably all do that right now. Can you make a sigh sound by tightening up either your throat or your and letting it come out. Let me hear you guys again. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because we got we got masks on, so everybody can't hear. But everybody has had a stenazo moment in your life where you just tell me to get hit me again with the stenazo. One, two, three, hit it. Oh. <laughs> and you have these moments, these stenazo moments, and you know, th this is the funny thing about a stenazo moment is that it says so much with saying so little, right? Think about a sigh. A sigh says so much. A sigh is just like, thank you, sweetheart. A, a sigh is like, oh, man. Mm -hmm. And you say so much, but saying so little. That's why I think in every, like, culture, the stenazo, sighs happen. It's like a, a universal language that we all have. Because it really is communicating something. And what I want to look at in the next 10 minutes is a, a, a little bit of what is it really communicating and what was Jesus communicating in this moment of his deepest sigh. He sighed and he looked up. If you look up deeper, the scripture actually says that the next thing that he did is he touched him and he said, be opened. See, I honestly think that the deep sigh came from an exasperated point and place of this man was being blocked. So what Jesus was really sighing at was not the fact that he was broken or sick or he was mad at this. He was mad or he was exasperated at this man is being blocked because he said be opened. Jesus wants you to be opened. And it makes him sigh. It makes his heart break. It hits him deep in his guts when he sees that you are comfortable with your blockages. 
Anybody feeling what I'm saying right here? Have you ever been to the point where you've got comfortable with your blockages and you just let the blockages come in like it's a piece of furniture in your room? It's like, don't mind that. That's just a blockage. Huh? And so, so in, in order for you to get into a new relationship, you have problems because you can't trust men anymore. And everybody, every man that tries to come into your life, God, bring somebody in your life. They can't get around that blockage. That's just, well, that's just a blockage. All men are dogs. That just, that's just my blockage. Huh? You know what? I got to hustle every time that I'm around some people. And what I really got to do is when I get around a new female, I got to just show myself off and I overcompensate. And I know it's looking stupid to some people, but you know what? That's just my block. These are my blocks. These are my toys, my blocks, my playing blocks. I play with my blocks all the time. I take my blocks everywhere I go. Is there anybody know what I'm talking about? These are my blockages. And those blockages right now, Jesus is saying... Are you just going to get used to that blockage? And, and what Jesus did is he said, be opened, let go, and allow that blockage to get removed. Give you a little hint of how I study sometimes, and I want to pass this on to you and share it with you because I, I, I've, I've been doing it for close to 30 years now, and, and I've been perfecting it, and it's been perfecting me, is that often I'll listen to scripture. I'm an audible learner, so I'll put on my Bible app. How many of you guys got that version Bible app represent? Yeah. I did that, but then I throw it onto the, the audio, and I'll play a, a version, so I'll play a little bit of Proverbs every day, and then a little bit of Psalms, and a little bit of New Testament. And what I do is I wait for a word to just kind of pop up at me almost I kind of call it like it bubbles up you know all of these words all of the scripture and what word bubbles up and it was just happens just so happened about a week ago this particular word about Jesus sighing bubbled up and for some reason it just stayed there and stayed at the top floated at the top of my mind and that's why I got into this whole study about when Jesus sighed there's only one other time in scripture in the book of Mark where it actually used this denazo word. And that's in the eighth chapter of the book of Mark. The eighth chapter, it says this. I'll tell you the story real quick and we'll run through it real quick. It says the Pharisees, they came and they began to argue with Jesus and see, seeking a sign from him, a sign from heaven so they could test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit. That's that same word, stenazo. He sighed deeply in his spirit and he says, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got into a boat again, went to the other side. Wonder what was going through Jesus' mind as these religious zealots Maybe it was because they just wanted to be right. You ever been around somebody that's so religious that really behind it, you can sense a type of fear? Like it's fear on tap. It's constant. It's a drip, drip, drip of fear that is really just fear. It's not just you love God. You're just afraid that God is going to be like, this is kingdom and kick you away from him. And so that, kid, that scare of being kicked in the stomach is driving you to act a certain way. The weird about thing about that, and I can say that, I can speak on it because I've been at places in my life where I've been religious. What happens is that that fear pervades and then it starts spreading to other people and you try to get other people to live in the realm of fear that you're living in. So you try to get them to be as religious as you. This is what I love about Jesus is that he went to the tax collectors. He went to the wine bibbers or to the party goers. And then he went to the religious folks and he loved them all the same. But these Pharisees, for some reason, maybe it was fear driven that they just could not let the issue go. And so they were like, we need a sign from heaven to show that you're real. We need a sign. We need a sign. And the Bible says that that just made Jesus help me preach my sermon by giving me a big sigh. That made Jesus just for real. Right? What made Jesus sigh? This is my belief is that what really what made Jesus sigh is Jesus sighed because of the Pharisees belligerence. 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 What does the word belligerence mean? It means like just hitting at it and hitting at it and hitting at it. Those of you who are in a relationship, you know what belligerence means. You ever get on the bad side of a relationship? 
where something that somebody has done just triggers you. Remember that time when you first loved that person and it was good and everything that they did was so cute? You know what? Science tells us now that when you actually fall in love, your brain goes through certain changes where you literally, all of the hormones moving through, moving through your brain, they form a type of cocktail that literally brainwashes you. You brainwash yourself when you're in love. Yes, you do. Because all of the stupid things that he's doing, you just look at it. It's so cute. Look at him. Just how he does. He's always talking. He just always talks. He just always has something to say. Nine months later, he is always talking. <laughs> he always has something to say about everything. Right? Because all, all of that brainwash cocktail just like wears off and you see things as they really are. And that belligerence is like this trigger, trigger, trigger. It triggers you, triggers you, triggers you. And I think that Jesus really sighed because he saw the belligerence. He saw the triggers in these religious people and he saw that they were triggered and they were triggered and they were triggered. And the Bible says, he said, I ain't giving you nothing. And left and went to the other side. So what was he really giving them an answer? What does God often do in our belligerence? Be quiet. God gets quiet so you can get quiet. Because you'll stop responding to the triggers when you just let the triggers go but you allow the triggers to trigger you and you just jump at the trigger and 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 become belligerent and become belligerent and become belligerent. Let me give you a scripture. And this is another great, great practice. If you want a good practice, the Hebrew Bible, the way the Hebrew Bible is fashioned they say that this psalm, Psalm 46 and 10, is actually, it strikes the exact middle point of the entire Hebrew Bible. It's the exact balanced middle point of the entire scope of the, the Torah, the law, the prophets, all of it. This is the gist of the entire matter. Be still and know that I am God. You want a good practice to do? If you're ever triggered, if you're ever stressed out, if you're ever at that place of stenosis where you just, <gasps> if you're ever at that place, <laughs> uh, let me tell you, let me open up and tell you guys, I got a little time to tell you guys. I wish my wife, she just coming in, she's going she to laugh at this. Okay, last, you know we're from Dallas, Texas. Whoop, whoop. I got three. Okay, good. Okay. So last week, you guys know that like Dallas went through this freeze, right? And we were cold, man. It was cold, but we were good because our lights were on. And so the first night, the first day, lights were on. First night, lights were on. That second day, it was about that third day, our lights actually went out. And by then, we had like, I had a, we had a neighbor whose lights went out. They didn't put their, their faucets on drip, so all of their stuff froze up. We kept our stuff on, uh, on drip, and we kept things right. But chiefly, I'll be honest, let me tell you, because my wife was like managing the whole thing. She was making sure, baby, make sure it's drip, because I don't care. I'm just like, it's just going to happen. I, I don't know. I'm just like, I'm, I'm that typical dude, head in the clouds, don't care. It's going to be all right. It's all going to work out. My wife is the practical member of the group okay so she's like make sure it's on drip and I was like get a okay so anyway however this is just me how me and my wife operate our kids make fun of us to this day okay this is how our kids how we operate at an emergency at a trauma moment often I think that God's given me the gift of possum because on the outside I'm chill you will never know that I'm freaking out on the inside 
And this happened over and over again. But my wife is just a real hood sister, okay? She just real. She just for real, for real, okay? She loves hard. She when she's going through pain, she lets you know she's in pain. She's just a real person. So when the lights went out, she was like, oh my gosh, the lights out. Let's go pack because we got to go over to my sisters and everything's gonna be okay. And it's about the fourth or fifth thing that she was having me do. About that fourth or fifth thing, I got tired and my panic started to kick in. But the way that I show panic is I chill and act like it's not bothering me, right? So, so, so this is what I did. Somebody gave me a gift of a book. So it was, and actually it was uh, Barack Obama's new book, you know, Promised Land. So I sat down in the most lighted room. It was a room that with the, the lights uh, right for the windows. We had no lights, but I was like, you know what? I'm going to sit down and I'm just going to chill. I finally got a chance. No electronics. I'm just going to sit and read this book, right? And so she was like, but baby, we got to do this. And this is what I said. And, and this is what I said, okay? And what I said, for, for, so what happened was, what I said, it, I, I like, have you ever allowed something to come out of your mouth that you didn't really pass by your prefrontal cortex? It, so it just kind of came from the limbic system, right? Just straight from the lizard brain, just like, boom, just <laughs> lizard style. You know, it just came straight out. And I did not pass it by the also wise filter of the prefrontal cortex. So, so when she was like, we got to do this, do that, I said, and I said it with attitude. I said it with feeling. I was like, girl, I ain't even trying to hear you right now. And it's funny because when it came out, prefrontal cortex was like, hold up, meeting, hold up, hold up, what did you just do? What did you just do? <laughs> and I was feeling good about what I said because prefrontal cortex was just like, yeah, I ain't even feeling you right now. This is crazy. Lights are out. All I got to do is sit here and chill and the lights will magically come on. Don't worry about nothing. But I said that. And when I said it, she was just like, you ain't trying to hear me. You're not listening to me. And all I can say <laughs> is I wish that I would have just sighed. Because if I would have sighed, one of the powerful things, before we go further, one of the powerful things that happens when you sigh, and, 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 and I found this in, in, in a study. There's a study that what happens when you sigh is, and, and we sigh, I didn't know this either. We sigh at least 10 times a day. Because often there is an imbalance of oxygen and NO, which is nitrogen oxide or whatever that kind of stuff. And there is this imbalance. And when you sigh, it, 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 re, it like recalibrates your body. Often also, thought-wise, thought so that's physical. Psychologically, when you sigh, you reset your thinking. You have a moment and you stop. When you sigh... So, 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 so I wish I would have sighed because I would have said, I would have allowed that come past my prefrontal cortex, but I didn't. I just said it. And, and I'm paying for that still today. I'm paying for that. I'm listening. <laughs> I'm listening because <laughs> I was paying for that. No, so, so, so this whole idea of, of, of be still and know, if you want a good way of like a good quick meditation, you could simply try this. Take that scripture. And you say the whole thing, and then you start eliminating each piece. So you can start with, be still and know that I am God. And you let that sit with that. And then you say, be still and know that I am. And you sit with that and let it do what it does. Then you go, be still and no. And you sit with that and let that do what it does. And then you get to the point where you say, be still. And let that settle. And get to the final part, be. It recalibrates you. It pulls you back. It brings you right back to focus. So I think that Jesus was concerned about these guys that was belligerent. And so he sighed. 
I think that Jesus was concerned. I wish I had more time. I'll tell you further, like if, if there's another story in Mark 1 and 40, I'll just say it real quick. And it doesn't say sigh. It's not the same word, but it's the same concept where he's like, as this leper came to Jesus, was like, if you really want to, you can make me clean. And the Bible says Jesus was moved with, with pity or compassion. Okay. Now that's what it says in our English Bible. But do you know that some actual translations of the manuscripts, early manuscripts, is a different word where he he said there, the particular word right there is a word that says uh, that he shifted in his uh, 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 his emotions. So it actually, one translation it says that he actually got angry quick. And see, I think that he got angry quick in this situation was because in the same sense, Jesus got mad because of the pain of the leper's isolation. And what's the answer that he gave to him? Not get out of my face. Not you'll ever make it in the kingdom. Not you're a poor example of a believer. His answer was, I want you to be touched. What was his answer to the deaf man? Be loosed. You're blocked. And I don't want you to be blocked anymore. What, what was his answer to, 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 the, to, to the belligerent Pharisees? What was his answer? It was, be quiet. What was his answer to this guy here? Was, be touched. Finally, one last thing, and I'll tell you, can I tell you this story real quick, and I don't have enough time. You guys know this very well, is the story of... Uh, Lazarus was being raised from the dead, and, and we get one of the famous, most famous verses, the shortest verse in the Bible, where Jesus cried, Jesus wept. Why did he cry? I believe because he cried ultimately because of the unbelief. So what was his answer to them? Is to be leave. So my first question that I ask you, have you ever made Jesus sigh? Don't lie. You probably made him sigh three times today. I'm sure I made him sigh five. But in each time that he sighs, it's never him saying, I'm tired of you. Get out of my face. I can't stand you or your mama. <laughs> it's never that. It's never that. Here's my message. God is not mad at you. He's madly in love with you. God is not mad at you. He's madly in love with you. God is not mad at you. He's madly in love with you. And when you're blocked, he's just saying, I want you to be open. And when you're belligerent, he's saying, I just want you to be still. And, and when you're isolated, he's saying, I want you to be touched. And when you're unbelieving, he's saying, I want you to believe. All. Oh, within one simple sigh. Let's close this time by joining in with Jesus in that sigh. Do you know what the word conspiracy means? The word conspiracy means spear is breath. Con means with. The word conspiracy actually comes from to breathe with. Why does it mean to breathe with? Well, you can imagine if somebody's telling a secret, they're like breathing together. Nobody else can hear them. They're breathing the concept together. What if we get into a conspiracy moment with Jesus about our own life, our own future, our own presence, and we sigh with him right now. What if you sigh? What if you, in your imagination, close your eyes right now, and in your imagination, when you take in this sigh and let it out, so much will be said with so little being said. Are you ready? Let's do it. One, two, three. <sighs> Thank you, Tabor. You guys have a wonderful week.